We should start. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Please take a seat. We're going to start. All right. Welcome to the 2017 celebration of the Asian and Pacific Islander American Heritage Month in Arlington County. My name is Cindy Ye from Arlington Economic Development. I'm very honored to be the Masters of Ceremonies for today's event. To begin, I would like to ask everyone to please stand for the Sheriff's Honor Guard Ceremony and singing of the National Anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fights over the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave over the land of the free and the home of the brave. Okay, thank you, please sit down. I have to give a special shout out. Pinkhurst is my son. <laughs> okay. Next, I want to invite Arlington County Board Chair, Mr. Jay Fazette, to say a few words and read the proclamation to declare May 2017 as Asian and Pacific Islander American Heritage Month. Uh, Mr. Fazette was first elected to the county board in 1998 and serves as chair for four, four times. And this will be Mr. Fazette's last year serving on the county board because he has chosen not to run for re-election. We'll be missing you, Mr. Fazette. Jay, here's the proclamation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Hello. All right. So uh, May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And just like we do in Arlington for all those other wonderful categories of people, whether it's African American, Latino, American Indian, LGBT, we take the opportunity to stop and celebrate all the value that, that you bring to our community and to our county. As I've learned, this was established in 1977 through an act of the US Senate. It was then expanded, and, and it was chosen at the early part of May, if you didn't know, because the month was the first, the, the month when the first Japanese immigrants arrived in the US in 1843 started out as a week and then became, in 1990, a month. 
Um, and before I read the proclamation, I want to read our county's vision statement because I think no community can really come together and actually do something like this unless you have a vision that incorporates the elements of what today is about. So years ago, I think it was around the year 2000, this community um, worked really hard on a vision statement. You all see it at the bottom of grams, maybe, <laughs> right? Well, it's still intact and it's really important because it guides the policy, the decisions. And it says Arlington will be a diverse and inclusive world-class urban community with secure, attractive residential and commercial neighborhoods where people you unite to form a caring, learning, participating, and sustainable community, again, in which each person is important, including each of the people that we, all the people that we are celebrating and embracing today. So uh, before I read the proclamation, I want to identify, I was asked to identify the VIPs in the room, and I know there are many members of the uh, cabinet or the, the manager's office in here. I'm not going to go through all of you, but I do see some of my colleagues on the county board. I see the vice chair, Katie Crystal, is here, and board members, Christian Dorsey and John Weistat. So please give them a round of applause. <laughs> so today, it's truly my honor on behalf of my colleagues and myself to read the uh, proclamation, Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month. Whereas continued immigration and population growth have resulted in almost 24,500 Asian and Pacific Islanders living in Arlington, constituting about 10.5% of our population. Whereas astoundingly diverse within its own ranks, Asian and Pacific Americans contribute to the great diversity of this nation of nations, that is America, and to the diverse and inclusive community of Arlington preserving the rich legacy of their native cultures while embracing the best values and traditions of the United States. Whereas through their multifaceted skills, traditions of hard work and creative entrepreneurship, this vital segment of our community has contributed to the prosperity and economic well-being of our county. Whereas Asian and Pacific, and Pacific Americans have brought with them strong family values and marvelous traditions which strengthen the very fabric of our society. And whereas, I love these words, through their unquenchable respect for education, indefatigable <laughs> industry, and persistent drive for excellence, Asian and Pacific Americans have demonstrated outstanding individual and group achievements in academia, government and business. Now, therefore, I, Jay Fassett, Chair of the County Board, and on behalf of my colleagues, do hereby proclaim May of 2017 as Asian and Pacific American Heritage Month. And I call upon all the residents of our fabulous community to observe this occasion by recognizing the contributions of Asian and Pacific Americans to our society in general and to our community in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fazette. Um, I would like to invite Mr. Christopher Kang, National Director for the National Council of Asian Pacific American, to come up and provide a few remarks. Mr. Kang is a resident of Arlington and was a former advisor to President Obama. Thank you very much uh, for this privilege uh, and real honor to be here. Uh, as many people do come to this region, uh, I came here uh, in pursuit of public service to work in government uh, 15 years ago. And when we looked around at where we wanted to live, uh, there was really only one choice for us, and it was Arlington. Uh, and I'll get to that in a couple minutes. But I did want to take a moment. My organization is the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans. We're a coalition of 34 
national Asian American and Pacific Islander organizations. And we really strive to promote public policy and shape public narratives that help advance our communities. And so that's why this month is so important. It's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, and it's the time to celebrate our culture, our heritage, our history, our contributions to this country, uh, which are all incredibly and vitally important. Uh, it's also time for us to reflect on the parts of our history that are a little bit more challenging. Uh, one of the other reasons why uh, Congress chose May as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month is May marks, and this May in particular, marks the 135th anniversary of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Uh, which is the first time that the U.S. government passed a law to exclude a specific group of people from immigrating to this country. And so that's a piece of our history. That's not one that I learned growing up, uh, in particular in Indiana. Uh, it's one that I don't think kids around the country really grow up learning. And so when we look around, uh, history has a way of repeating itself sometimes. And I think it's important for us to not only take this time to celebrate the accomplishments, but really to learn our history, to take this moment and to teach our history back. Uh, the other moment that I'd like to take uh, to teach a little bit more about the diversity of our community is that the Asian American community is the fastest growing uh, racial or ethnic group in the nation, now it's 6%. And I think that sometimes one of the challenges we confront is the so-called model minority myth, the idea or the reality that on average, on average, uh, Asian Americans have the highest educational attainment, highest average income. And as I think about it, it sort of actually reflects some of the challenges that I think that Arlington faces, and in particular the county, as it looks at the fact that Arlington does on average very well. Some lowest unemployment rates, highest income, highest educational rate, but we all know that that's not true for all of our citizens here. And in the same way, that's not true for the Asian American community. There's great diversity, almost 50 ethnicities, speaking hundreds of languages that sort of make up this umbrella of Asian Americans. And so as we think, one statistic that I think is particularly striking to me, because we think about, again, this stereotype of model minority myth and Asian Americans having the highest educational attainment on average, 94% uh, of Japanese Americans have a high school diploma, uh, compared to 81% of Chinese Americans, 71% percent of Vietnamese Americans, and only 62 percent of Cambodian and Hmong Americans. So there's a wide variety here. And especially living in a community like this, with the government as diverse as this, we really need to make sure that we're reaching out to all of our, all of our citizens, and in particular, making sure that we make a special effort to understand and fully appreciate and serve the diversity of the AAPI community. And that's why I think that the great part about Arlington, uh, I grew up in Indiana. My entire middle school probably didn't have 10 kids of color in it. Uh, and now my daughter, who will be starting at Ashland in the fall, uh, is living in a place where 10% of this community is Asian American in itself, not to mention uh, the, the diversity of African Americans, Hispanics, immigrants from across the country or across the world. Uh, and it's really exciting. And I think the other piece that's so exciting to me to be part of this celebration is really living in a place where the government, the people who work in this government, the people who serve in this government, reflect the diversity of the people they serve. And that is a principle that I really strove to implement on behalf of President Obama with respect to the judiciary. It's something that makes me so excited to hear from Marsha in a few minutes, but really being able to embrace all of the diversity and strength and the values that are, are in, the, in the mission of Arlington. Uh, and that is why I think this community has been such a welcoming, such an exciting place for us to start our family and to grow here, why I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, the last thing I'll note, uh, I'm excited for this entire program. I'm particularly excited to hear from the the high school students at Wakefield High School. Uh, I joined Twitter about a year, uh, a year and change ago, and I had these people follow me and, and retweet some of the things I, I wrote. It was this WHS Asian Club. And I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. That looks cute. That, you get a little Asian club somewhere. And then uh, I was looking at it, so, and then I was realized that the HS stood for high school uh, and that the W was Wakefield. I was like, well, that's weird. I know. That is Wakefield, that's Wakefield High School, just here in Arlington. Uh, and I think that that says a lot about this community, to have a, a group of high school students really embrace their culture, their identity, be able to teach that out, not only in their own school, but this entire county uh, is fantastic. And so as much as I enjoy following them on Twitter, I'm really excited to meet them and see them perform here in real life. And so thanks again for this incredible opportunity.
Thank you, Mr. Kang. Next, is our speaker is a very familiar face to many of us. Marsha Algayer, former deputy county manager who has retired after 37 years of service, will provide some remark. Marsha has been the chair of this event for many, many years. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's so nice to be back here in Arlington, and specifically in this room, where I've spent hours in 37 years. <laughs> So thank you to the Celebration Planning Committee for inviting me back. And uh, this event is so near and dear to my heart, so it's really very uh, nice to be featured on this program. I hope you'll forgive me if I'm a bit serious today. I mean, what are you going to do? They, they can't fire me now. So uh, <laughs> if I'm a bit serious today in the midst of our happy celebration. But February, tw February 19, 2017, was the 75th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, signed by F President Franklin D. Roosevelt, which led to the displacement and imprisonment of as many as 200,000 residents of the United States, two-thirds of them American citizens by birth, on the basis of race and national origin. In the current political climate of controversial executive orders, it is timely to reflect on this anniversary in the context of celebrating our Asian and Pacific Islander heritage. I think many of us are familiar with the broad historical Pacific, uh, outlines of EO 9066 and its consequences, but you may, may not be familiar with some of the details and side stories. First, let me define a few terms I'm going to be using. Uh, Issei is the first generation. My grandparents were Issei. They emigrated to Hawaii from Japan in the early years of the 20th century. Uh, Nisei is the second generation. My parents were Nisei, born and raised in Hawaii, fluent in both English and Japanese. I am Sansei, third generation, fully Americanized and barely able to speak Japanese. I'm not spending time on the best known aspects of Executive Order 9066, the 10 so-called relocation camps in isolated locations in seven states, set up in early 1942 and not closed until after the end of World War II. As a side note, some of them have been designated historic sites, and this summer I'm going to be visiting perhaps the most restored of the sites, Manzanar, which is 200 miles northeast of Los Angeles. But back to the two points I want to make. First, the executive order was the result of a long history of racial prejudice and exclusion as it pertained to American residents of Asian heritage. It did not pop up whole cloth from nothing, and it was not a justified response to war and military necessity. Second, although there was mass displacement on the West Coast, which led to extreme hardship and injustice that constitute a blight on our country's history, there was not the same action taken in Hawaii, where my family was, and which contained a sizable Japanese-American population. To the first point, let's put Executive Order 9066 in historical context. By the end of the 1920s, the US had declared that Japanese and Chinese could not enter the country, could not own land in many states, including California, could not marry whites, could not become naturalized citizens, mandated loss of US citizenship for women who married aliens who were ineligible for naturalization, and deprived Japanese American veterans of World War I of the generally accorded privilege of eligibility for naturalization. So there was a long history of racial prejudice that contributed to a favorable climate for racist reaction after Pearl Harbor. It should note that I'm focusing on Japanese Americans, but Chinese Americans suffered an even longer history of racist treatment. When Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, there was a clamor for rounding up all the Japanese Americans without regard to any factual evidence of sabotage or espionage. Uh, interestingly, J. Edgar Hoover said that internment was not necessary, while Earl Warren, then Attorney General of California and future Supreme Court Chief Justice, supported internment. There were lies, now called alternative news, about Japanese American espionage and sabotage spread by the media, fueled by officials such as Frank Knox, Secretary of the Navy, and feeding FDR's long history of anti-Japanese sentiment. There was relatively little outcry by community leaders against internment. Among religious, religiously affiliated organizations, only the American Friends Service Committee of the Quakers and the Black Muslims openly protested the internment. In Hawaii, the situation was thankfully a little bit different. 
As Franklin Odo said in his 2004 book, No Sword to Bury, quote, in Hawaii, where the Japanese American community was both feared and needed, Pearl Harbor could have at least unleashed racial dynamics that dramatically impeded the war effort, unquote. But a combination of economic practicality, an older and larger community more solidly entrenched in local society, and the strong voices of key people in Hawaii's multicultural community led to a different result. In the face of war hysteria and despite an uneven history of race relations, Hawaii avoided the worst of the reaction that characterized the mainland. Why? First and foremost, Japanese Americans constituted a large percent of the population and more than half of the skilled workforce. The Japanese Americans were indispensable to the general economic well-being and prosecution of the war in Hawaii while it was preparing for an anticipated Japanese invasion. In fact, right after the December 7th attack, martial law was declared and a plurality of Hawaii's multi-ethnic multi volunteer guard force defending Hawaii from a feared Japanese attack was Japanese American. However, after about six weeks, the military governor, Governor Emmons, uh, General Emmons, ejected Japanese Americans from the Hawaii Territorial Guard. I should say that General Emmons was under enormous pressure from President Roosevelt and the War Department to round up the Japanese Americans. Odo says that, quote, Hawaii's military governor sometimes had to circumvent orders to avoid doing just that, unquote. General Emmons' restraint was part of the reason Hawaii was able to avoid the mass evacuation and detention of Japanese Americans that was carried out on the mainland. Other individuals played a crucial role. There were two major newspapers in Hawaii. One, the advertiser, was strident and vicious in calling for extreme action. The other, the Star Bulletin, was more restrained, and its editor, Riley Allen, forbade his staff the use of the term Jap during the entire war. The military cooperated with civilian leaders to form a public morale division, which served as a liaison between the military and the civilian community, and which would, quote, work toward maintenance of a unified and cooperative community in the face of the heterogeneous character of the local community, unquote. Three persons were appointed to the unit, a well-respected Howley, that's Hawaiian for Caucasian, outsider, the Chinese YMCA secretary, and a Nisei school principal and administrator. They were critical in maintaining relative racial harmony, including forming a civilian unit of 169 Nisei who volunteered to do hard labor in support of the war effort. After less than a year, the unit proved its worth and was disbanded as many of its members volunteered for the newly formed Japanese American 442nd Regimental Combat Team. So institutions and individuals were willing to take strong stances and strategic actions to allay fears and obviate any perceived need for internment, and they could appeal to the need to prosecute the law fully. Also, the Japanese American population was very fearful and anxious to reduce suspicion. As a child, I once remember hearing my parents talking to their friends about the war years, about hiding a hunting rifle or a Japanese language newspaper or anything that could be deemed suspicious. What would have happened if there had been one, just a single incident of espionage or sabotage by a Japanese American? Would it have all fallen apart? Actually, it's a bit of a miracle that that did not happen. So on February 19, 1976, on the 34th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, President Gerald Ford issued Proclamation 4417, citing concerns, quote, among many Japanese Americans that there may yet be some life in that obsolete document. I think it appropriate in this our bicentennial year to remove all doubts on that matter and to make clear our commitment in the future, unquote. And then he proclaimed that 9066 officially terminated with the cessation of hostilities of World War II on December 31, 1946. President Ford called upon, quote, the American people to affirm with me this American promise that we have learned from the tragedy of that long ago experience forever to ensure liberty and justice for each individual American and resolve that this kind of action shall never again be repeated, unquote. These words hopefully carry weight now and in the future, but please remember that Executive Order 9066 was never declared unconstitutional. 
the evacuation of Japanese Americans, most of them American citizens, from designated areas due to medical ne military necessity without establishing individual guilt was not found by the Supreme Court to be unconstitutional. One would hope that it would never be allowed to happen again, that we would all stand up, protest, challenge, take political action to prevent it. But remember that this kind of thing can creep up on us and spin out of control if we are not careful and vigilant. In these volatile and disconcerting times, we must not be complacent and assume that we will never make such a mistake again, that we will never, on the basis of race, national origin, religion, sexual preference, political beliefs, or any other matter of identity, take such action on a group based on prejudice instead of on evidence. <sighs> <laughs> Well, I didn't really mean to give a sermon, but recent events have been most upsetting to me. So reviewing a history can be most useful to ensure that we are not doomed to repeat our mistakes, and celebrating our diverse heritage can help us appreciate what we have to lose if we do not value our diversity and freedoms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marsha. Before we proceed to the performances, I want to mention that today's show is only for an hour long, but it took months of preparation from county staff. Many of them are here today. I would like to recognize a few. Those of you, please stand up. Those, who are, those of you who are in the planning committee, if you're already standing up, please raise your hand and wave so we know who you are. Yeah, okay, yes. Um, Many of them put their personal time, money, resources, and cooking skills to make today possible. In particular, I want to mention a few people. The chairwoman, Aruna Minas, from the, the county manager's office. She, she really was the quarterback for today's event. Kate Barbie also created this beautiful flyer and the program. And there's so many, my colleagues, Tina Modi, my colleague, Janine Finch, who's the professional photographer to, for today's event. And also, when you go up to enjoy the food, please also thank Kim Fan, the organizer of the food. She spent hours organizing everything. Mieko French, everybody helps tremendously. And also, there are some seats also in the front. If you, those people at the back, please feel free to come up here to watch the performances. Okay, now on with the performances. Our first performance is from my colleague, Ms. Tina Modi. She will be doing a Bollywood dance. And the song title is Ghani Bawari and Ajay Nakli. Okay. Let me be 
Okay, our next performers are from Wakefield High School. Um, we, the first performer will be, uh, please come up. I know you have to get ready, so please come up. The students from Wakefield High School, Feng Nguyen. Okay, I hope I'm, okay. Huh? Oh, okay, yeah, yes. And their teacher, Miss Maggie Xu. Okay, please, all the Wakefield High School students, they, thank you for coming to, yeah. You guys know what this instrument is? Yeah, it's familiar, right? Um, uh, it's my favorite instrument, actually. <clears throat> so the song I'm going to be playing is Somewhere Over the Rainbow by Israel Kamekowabiwole. Uh, he's a Hawaiian singer, and he died years past due to obesity. So in memory of this, of this wonderful musician, I'd like to sing this song.
साहेबान कदर साहेबान कदरदान मेहरबान दिल थाम के बैठिए क्योंकि अब आपके सामने तशरीफ ला रही है much our next performance it will be this will be a taekwondo performance a martial arts demonstrations from students uh, at the Jeonri taekwondo school mr francis pineda daniela zapata and max de la cruz oh there's only two oh max de la cruz okay so come on please come on hi and thanks uh thanks so much for having us um 
My name is Francis Pineda. I am uh, one of the owners uh, and instructors at the Junior Taekwondo School in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Um, accompanied here by two of my instructors and students, Daniel Zapata and Max De La Cruz. Um, taekwondo uh, came from Korea. It formed in the 40s and 50s, but as a conglomeration of ancient martial arts that were thousands of years old. Uh, our grandmaster, uh, Jun Ri, brought it to the United States in 1963 uh, as an exchange student at the University of Texas, and it just kind of spread from that point forward. Um, it is the national sport of Korea, uh, practiced worldwide, and it entered the Olympics in the year 2000, as you guys know. Uh, forms uh, resemble an imaginary fight. It requires focus, strength, power, precision, and memorization to specified patterns. If you've ever taken martial arts before or Taekwondo, you'll be very familiar with one of these traditional patterns. They will be performing Chunji, uh, meaning heaven and earth. All right, chat it. Chunbi. Class. This was no music to this one. Yes. Begin. Come on. I thought you look familiar if you've ever taken martial arts before. And we are in a kind of a tight space, so hopefully uh, <laughs> they don't hit each other. <laughs> uh, Grand Mastery wanted to emphasize the art side of martial arts because martial arts is usually in two halves. There's a martial side, which represents the defense and the fighting, and then there's the art side, and this is kind of what you saw here. But he wanted to put extra emphasis on the art side, so what he did was he choreographed music into forms. Um, he uh, choreographed one to the theme of Exodus. It's called Might for Right. And you'll kind of notice some symbolism throughout the form. Like you'll see them uh, do certain motions with their hands and they'll start in one motion where left covers the right, which symbolizes uh, in the beginning left uh, dominated over good. And then uh, there was a clash. And then at the end, right dominated over good. And that was kind of the theme, Might for Right, that good always wins over evil. Um, so. This is the one that needs the music. Might for right to Exodus. Can be.
Mun. Hyv. Sjov. And if, and, uh, if you guys didn't know, uh, Max is actually Kate Barbie's son, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So weapons are a part of uh, martial arts also. Um, and uh, most of the weapons uh, come from Japan. We've actually picked one that originated from the Philippines. Um, so uh, it's, these are Screamer Sticks, basically two pieces of rattan, and they've kind of choreographed their own uh, routines. <laughs> and that's all we have to offer. We want to thank you guys for allowing us to be a, a part in this celebration that really um, embraces the diversity that Asian Pacific Islanders have uh, added. Um, and actually, I didn't know that there was food, so I'm <laughs> really looking forward to the reception. All right, guys, get it. Hi. Before going, to our, going into our final performance, I just want to give a special shout out to our intrepid county manager, Mark Schwartz. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, but he gives us his greetings. Okay, now to our final performance of the day. It will be performed by Ms. Vidya Sankarayanan. She will be doing a Brihadesha dance. It's a classical Indian dance. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, before I conclude today's program, I want to bring you to your attention that we have here Ms. Kim O'Connell, who is the author of Echoes of Little Saigon. This booklet, this beautiful illustrated booklet, um, was um, produced by Arlington Cultural Affairs and the Arlington Historic Society and Center for Local History with a grant from the Virginia uh, Endow Foundation for the Humanity Humanities. Um, this Miss um, O'Connell is, uh, is a Vietnamese immigrant and she lives in Arlington. This book was produced also by my colleague, Eliza Schiff from the Cultural Affairs Group. Uh, she, they will be at the back at the atrium to sign this book. It has beautiful illustrations about the Vietnamese uh, uh, immigrant community in Arlington, and many of them came to the United States and settled in Clarendon. There are some beautiful photos about Clarendon, which doesn't look like anything it is today. So it's wonderful that there's a book that preserves the history of Clarendon in the 1970s and 80s. So this concludes our program for today. Please join, join me in thanking all the, all the performers that came here today.